Hi there, if you're studying labour market economics for your exams in 2025, then this video is for you. Let's look at 10 areas of context in terms of some key issues for the labour market in 2025. First of all, unemployment. Well, here's the unemployment rate uh, as a percentage of the labour force for the UK since the start of the global financial crisis in 2008. And broadly speaking, the news has been good. The rate of unemployment fell during the sort of mid-teens, picked up obviously during the pandemic, but only peaked at about 5.5%, in large part because of the impact of the furlough scheme, the wage subsidy, which in turn cost about £75 billion during the lockdown. But unemployment is now starting to edge higher. It's now 4.3% and is forecast to rise closer to 5% by the end of this year. And that's due to an economic slowdown. The UK economy is growing slowly and is in fact on the edge of a technical recession. Oftentimes with unemployment, if you look beneath the surface, you get some very interesting statistics. So this chart shows regional unemployment as a share of the labour force in the autumn of 2024. UK figure 4.3%. I've blanked out the, the highest and the lowest regions, and I wonder if you can get a guess which they are, and in the right order. Have a go. Well, the highest unemployment in the UK is actually in London. The lowest is in Northern Ireland. Some people think that Northern Ireland is benefiting <coughs> from the rapid growth and very high per capita incomes in the Irish Republic, and that could be one factor indeed. Another factor, though, is economic inactivity. That's people who are out of, uh, of working age, not in work and not actively seeking work for a variety of reasons. They might be looking after relatives. They might be long term sick. They could be early retired. Uh, they could be full time students. This chart shows economic inactivity in the UK uh, for the last 20, 25 years by country. And you can see the green line there shows that Northern Ireland, uh, alongside Wales, has the highest rates of inactivity. In fact, uh, in 2024, 28% uh, of adults in Northern Ireland are economically inactive. That's quite a high figure. So some of the low unemployment is in part due to the fact that many people are out of work, non-employed, but not actively looking for work. And that is a factor clearly having economic and social consequences in the region. Here's the chart showing the reasons why people are inactive from being full time students, long term sickness, some of which linked to long COVID, looking after family at home, including looking after elderly relatives, people have retired and other factors. And there has been an increase in the rate of long term sickness as a factor. It's now the dominant cause. Let's look at skill shortages and recruitment retention difficulties. This has been a major issue in the last two or three years, picked up by exam boards in questions. This is a, a survey of the percentage of businesses in the UK experiencing worker shortages in 2024. Overall, about 8% uh, of industries are experiencing labour shortages. It's higher for arts, entertainment, recreation. It's higher in the hospitality sector and also in construction. Lower in information and communication and professional activities and also in real estate. But clearly there are some industries and within that some businesses that do find it hard both to attract and retain skilled labour. And my view is that changes to visa rules post-Brexit have affected labour shortages in sectors such as construction, hospitality and care. We'll come back to work visas in a few minutes. One of the uh, indicators of labour shortages is the number of job vacancies. Now, these are jobs that have not yet been filled, posted in job centres and other centres, other on things like online employment sites. And you can see that there was a significant increase in the number of job vacancies as the economy came out of the pandemic. <clears throat> Pardon me. This is in part, of course, the result of long COVID and the fact that uh, people had perhaps changed their attitudes to work-life balance, so on and so forth. But lots of industries did face skilled labour shortages, notably in things like truck driving, uh, in social care and in construction. Now, the number of vacancies is falling quite sharply. And that's often an important indicator of the degree of labour market tightness. So the fall you see there, particularly during 2023 and into 2024, could be a sign that many businesses are scaling back the number of people they intend to hire as we head into 2025. Uh, maybe a lead indicator again of economic weakness. Let's think about low pay in the labour market. I call this the long tail of relatively low wage jobs. This chart shows the median full-time 
gross, in other words, before tax, weekly pay of the lowest paid occupations in the UK. The data is for 2023. And again, I've blanked out the top two. So which occupations do you think are the lowest paid jobs in the UK? By the way, this data won't change much, won't change much in 2024. Well, the answer is that retail cashiers and checkout operators and childminders are the lowest paid by some distance compared to waiters and waitresses. But you can see from this chart that many of these jobs are relatively low skilled, uh, and oftentimes entry level jobs for younger people, and they're not well paid. Don't forget, this is the median full time gross weekly pay. So if you're earning £400 a week before tax, you're earning around £20,000 a year before tax. So you won't take home £20,000 because you're going to be paying income tax at 20% on some of it and national insurance as well. This chart shows median earnings for full-time employees. Now the 10th percentile is the people who are you know, towards the bottom end of the income scale. They have a median earnings. That includes things like overtime of £22,763. And you can see it rises gradually as we move up those percentiles. Indeed, up to including uh, the 30th percentile, median earnings are less than £30,000 a year. Whereas for the 90th percentile, it's 72000 And obviously, as we move up towards the 100th percentile, the chart gets even steeper. This is linked to the high level of relative poverty in the UK. According to the latest data from the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, 4.3 million children are living in relatively poor households. And many are living in families who are experiencing low pay. So one or more people have a low paid job or in families where people aren't in work, families with high economic inactivity. Earnings have been going up. People's pay packets have been on the on the by and, by and large been going up, as you can see from the blue line here. This is the annual rate of growth of total pay in nominal terms. But if we take off the effects of inflation, this is what you get. Real pay adjusts for the effects of inflation. And you can see the grey line is much closer to and sometimes well below the 0% line. Now, when it's below, real wages are falling. For millions of people, actually, their real pay is no higher than it was a few years ago. And in many cases, quite a bit lower. And disposable income takes into account uh, the impact of direct taxes and welfare benefits. Now, this is real disposable income per household. It's the median level, and that has been climbing. Mean is well above the median. The rising gap between high and low pay is one reason for that. But can you see here that mean real disposable income in 2013 is actually below where it was uh, 15 years ago? Youth unemployment. Again, the UK unemployment rate is 4.3% although that varies by region, and it varies by age and by gender and by ethnicity. And it also varies by age, and youth unemployment is rising once again. Here's the chart showing male and female youth unemployment. And male youth unemployment is now climbing quite steeply, heading towards 20%. Now, unemployment rates for younger workers had been falling in the last 10 years, which was welcome news. It went up during the pandemic, but fell back again quite sharply. But this is another thing to look out for in 2025, that youth unemployment is going up again. And I think in part it's the fact that young workers are finding it hard to get entry level jobs. And two reasons there could be the increase in national insurance contributions announced in the October 2024 budget and also successive rises in the minimum wage. There is, of course, there was there remains a persistent gender pay gap in the labour market. Now, that gap has fallen, as this chart shows. This looks at the gender pay gap in the UK from 1997, and it arranges it by age. And you can see that, by and large, it has come down. But the gap remains. Across all sectors, it's 13% for equivalent jobs, but it's more than twice that in financial and insurance businesses, and also very high in things like education, professional, scientific and technical. It's much lower in industries such as transportation and storage, uh, arts, entertainment and recreation and so on and so forth. But there still remains a significant gender pay gap. Trade unions. It's important to know what has happened to trade unions in recent times. If one goes back many, many years to the late 1970s, more than a half of the labour force were members of a trade union. That is now 
changed radically. This chart shows trade union density. In other words, how many uh, people are members of a union as a proportion of employment. Go back to 1995, 30 years ago, 32.4% of people were members of a union. That figure has now dropped to 22.5%. So take a moment to think about this. In the UK labour market, less than one worker in four is a member of a trade union. Three quarters are not. Now, in some sectors, it's higher. For example, in the public sector, in the NHS, in transport, in energy. But in other sectors, farming, hospitality, retail, it's a very, very low percentage of employment. And trade union membership falling, uh, well, we've also seen the rise of the big employers. So this is something that's definitely worth revising ahead of your labour market paper this year. The rise of monopsony employment. And this chart shows the largest companies based in the UK by number of global employees in 2024. So some of these employers will be located outside the UK. Compass Group is one of the world's largest outsourcing companies, providing a range of business services. Three more issues to think about in our time together. First of all, migration. Well, there has been, as you can see, a significant rise in long term migration into the UK. It fell in 2020 because of the impact of the lockdown and the pandemic, but it climbed very, very sharply in 21 and 22 and 23 before dipping a little bit, albeit from very high levels in 2024. So for the past three years, well over 1.2 million people per year have come into the UK. But people leave. So the black line here shows emigration, people leaving. Uh, but you can see the gap has widened. And indeed, over the last three years, we've had net migration, the balance between the blue and the black line of more than 600,000 people. Now, in part, in part, that is due to the return of overseas students to UK schools, colleges and universities. That has been a factor. But another really important factor has been the surge in the number of work visas granted in the UK. And we left the European Union five years ago, actually five years ago this week. And uh, so that uh, brought an end to free movement of labour between the UK and fellow European Union countries. And so there's been a fall in inward migration from the EU. But there's been a significant rise in inward migration uh, from outside the EU. And as you can see, a sizable jump in the number of work visas, which were over 600,000 in 2024. Now, many of these work visas are a response to labour shortages. Businesses and industries complaining that they can't recruit and retain the skilled workers they need. Let's have a little look at AI. So it's kind of a little look to the future. People are becoming very excited about the potential from AI from an economic perspective, but clearly it's going to have a consequence for the labour market. And this survey looks at the global impact of AI and big data analytics on jobs. And broadly speaking, in terms of negative, neutral, positive, this survey is relatively positive in terms of its contribution to new jobs. Uh, big data analytics, artificial intelligence can substitute some jobs, but it can also act as a complement creating jobs in other industries. On the one hand, AI should be positive for the labour market. It can automate repetitive tasks. It can enable workers to focus on higher value activities. AI tools in diagnostic healthcare, for example, is a really good example to choose. So if AI drives productivity higher, that should lift incomes per capita, which is good news for the economy. And it will expand the demand for high skill employment. AI creates demand for jobs in AI data science, machine learning engineers, so on and so forth. And it can boost regional development. The government's particularly keen to create some new growth clusters, some new growth zones to attract inward investment to underserved areas, hoping to revitalise post-industrial regions with new infrastructure, such as data centres, job creation and innovation hubs. The aim is to reduce structural long-term unemployment within certain regions. But on the other hand, of course, there will be some job displacement and there is the big risk of structural unemployment. So AI might lead to the replacement of some jobs in jobs like manufacturing, routine, routine administration and retail. And this could cause a rising long-term unemployment for people affected. Well, AI is an industry, a sector, uh, an area of economics that's well worth thinking about as we head through the next 12 months. On the other hand, of course, keep in mind the environmental impact. Lots of students come up to me when I give my talks and say, well, have you, have you thought about the impact on the environment? And I have. And this is a, a really interesting forecast showing global electricity demand 
from data centers, from cryptocurrencies, and from dedicated AI. And you can see that by 2026, there's going to be a step change in the demand for electricity globally. Can the world keep pace? Do we have the water? Do we have the, the energy reserves to be able to cope? Finally, a quick word on the minimum wage. Minimum wage has gone up, gone up very gradually during the low inflation years, particularly from sort of 2008 onwards. But it went up. This is the wage rate, by the way, for under 18s. But you can see in the last two or three years that have been to a couple, well, three step changes in the minimum wage, in part because the government wants to lift wages for younger workers to encourage people into the labour force. And secondly, secondly, because of the cost of living crisis, prices have gone up and the minimum wage has gone up in, in response. And here's the national living wage. It's not quite the true living wage, but it's the, what the government calls the minimum wage these days. And you can see it's gone up from £8.72 in 2020 to a new level from this spring of £12.21 for adult workers. Now, this rise in the minimum wage is largely driven by the need to respond to high inflation so that the real, the real value of the minimum wage is maintained. And the government also wants to increase the minimum wage towards two thirds of median hourly earnings. And whilst that's beneficial to those people who are affected, there are some downsides. And I think we're seeing some evidence now that lots of employers are starting to say, well, the minimum wage is really starting to bite, particularly for small and medium sized enterprises in sectors such as tourism and hospitality and retail, where profit margins are very thin. I think this is an issue to watch. Further rises in minimum wage under current economic conditions may well prove to be counterproductive. So there we go. Thanks for staying with me. If you have done, we've been through 10 topical issues in the UK labour market. I hope this helps give you some context for your exams in 2025. Stay happy, stay curious, stay healthy and see you sometime soon.